pleased to introduce Dr. Brenda Bonnet. Dr. Bonnet qualified as a veterinarian at the University of Guelph in Canada. After many years as a tenured associate professor at the Department of Population Medicine, Ontario Veterinary College, University of Guelph, she is now a consulting epidemiologist and CEO of the nonprofit International Partnership for Dogs. I Dr. Bonnet's academic achievements include peer reviewed publications and book chapters in the fields of population based and clinical epidemiology, theriogenology, human animal interactions, veterinary education and communication, and population based research using secondary data sources. Dr. Bonnet has been awarded an honorary doctorate by the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. In addition to her esteemed academic career, Dr. Bonnet has facilitated workshops on accessible veterinary care, and as lead scientist at Morris Animal Foundation, she assisted in the development of the now titled Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. Dr. Bonnet initiated the IPFD as a multi-stakeholder collaborative organization to enhance the health, well-being, and welfare of dogs and to support human-dog interactions. We are thrilled to have Dr. Bonnet present to this year's Embark Canine Health Summit. Please post any questions you have for Dr. Barnett in the chat box, and she will answer questions from the audience as part of the live Q&A afterwards. Welcome, Dr. Bonnet. Hello, and thanks to Embark for inviting me to talk to you today about breeding healthy puppies and sustaining your breed, the goal, and how do you get there? We'll be discussing integration of appropriate health testing into the breeding of healthy dogs and breeding populations. As you know, I'm Brenda Bonnet and I'm Veterinary Science Officer of the International Partnership for Dogs. My CV is here, you can read it later, but I'm, the most important items are I'm a veterinarian and an epidemiologist. And I have been working for many, many years on many topics in uh, dog health and welfare and all companion animals, and especially working on population-based data internationally. Why are you hearing from the International Partnership for Dogs today? Well, briefly, our goal is to enhance the health, well-being, and welfare of dogs and to support great human-dog interactions. We are international, as is the dog world. We're multi-stakeholder. We believe everyone, vets, researchers, breeders, judges, everybody has a responsibility to address health and welfare in dogs, and we take a broad view. And uh, IPFD is impartial and evidence-based, so we talk a lot about science, but we're also very conscious of the emotional side of the dog world as well. And we believe that collaboration and sharing is the most important way forward. So a brief outline of today's talk is that we'll look at the big picture in dog breeding and breeding decisions and what are the pieces of that puzzle. We'll talk about making the most out of genetic testing and what are the key resources you need to consider and where can you find them. In addition, we'll present resources and links on Dog Wellnet from IPFD uh, to help you and uh, in addition to this talk, uh, you'll be able to get a PDF of this presentation to help you find the resources and look for them. What is the big picture in dog breeding? Well, last year I had uh, the honor to speak to the Rhodesian Ridgeback Club of Canada at their national specialty, and I really like their code of ethics. It says that you are to breed, to preserve and improve your breed without exploiting it. And I think that is the perfect lead in to talking about the big picture. So if we work through the big picture from the point of view of preserve and improve the breed, Presumably, you would agree that uh, we want to breed to 
preserve the breed in its original form for its original purpose. Uh, of course, regardless of what is said about honoring tradition, breed standards do get changed. But hopefully, one of the original purposes is to make sure that dogs are fit for function. Now, we run into some problems these days when the function of a dog is simply a companion animal, and it seems that some people lower their expectations about fitness. But we like to think of dogs first and breeds second, so there are some basic considerations and char characteristics we should want them to have. So uh, the Scandinavian breed clubs and kennel clubs talk a lot about all dogs should be able to see, breathe, and move freely. And hopefully that's a pretty basic thing we can all agree on. Veterinarians and welfare people tend to look at basic welfare in terms of the five freedoms, which are freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain and injury and disease, freedom to express normal behavior. And here we're really talking about basic normal dog behavior without the requirements being reduced for markedly for specific breeds. And then freedom from fear and distress. So if we look at those applied to breeding, these should be protected for all offspring of uh, breeding. The first, freedom from hunger and thirst, that's up to the owners and not the topic of this talk today. When we look at aspects of uh, inherited confirmation that may create discomfort in the dog, we can think about things like hips, elbows, and spines that might cause congenital problems, as well as compromised breathing due to confirmation, and even chronic skin diseases as another example. And if we're selecting for type on confirmation, that can cause discomfort when these conditions are likely to be inherited and affect the offspring. Predisposition to injury can also be due to confirmation. And we know there's breed increased risk for specific diseases and sometimes disease in general can be inherited. Of course, many injuries and diseases occur randomly, but we're talking about things that we should know ahead of time are likely to be inherited with a given breeding pair. The ability to have normal dog behavior means a dog should be able to groom its entire body. It should be able to engage in normal facial and tail expressions and typical dog behavior. And we're talking about basic behavioral needs of all dogs. And if they can't express them, that can lead to discomfort or distress. For fear and distress, um, fear can be a function of temperament and how a dog was raised but here we're talking again about inherited tendencies and certainly dogs can be in distress from things like hampered breathing if we're talking about preserving and improving the breed we should also be thinking of longevity and genetic diversity the sustainability of any breed depends on those two items. And we'll talk about that more as we go along. So that's my view of the big picture. And obviously, there's a role for health tests in determining uh, animals that are predisposed to pass problems on to their uh, offspring. And for the conditions I've listed, some of them have health tests of different kinds, but many don't. And many depend on a knowledgeable and careful selection of breeding animals. And that's something for you to think about as you uh, select breeding pairs. So maybe what I've described here is an ideal. What happens in reality? Well, 
What are your short-term short -term goals? Which comes first? Are you primarily focused on show-winning puppies? And if so, how many of those do you expect to get in any litter? What about the rest of the litter? Or would you say your primary short-term goal is to produce healthy offspring? Can there be a balance still while protecting the breed to go for show winning dogs and still protect the breed? In terms of long-term goals, is your major goal to develop your line? Well, that's okay, but depending on how you do it, it might involve a lot of line breeding. Or would you say you are first and foremost focused on the breed, breed health, and sustainability. And I guess the reality part of this is I know that many of you really just want to have some fun with your dogs. And I'm describing things that make that almost impossible. But a brief but important notice here, show winning and good health and welfare should not have to be in conflict. And they aren't for many breeds, and they are for some breeds. So as we go along, what we have to do is find this balance between what people want and what dogs need, and quite honestly, what they deserve if we're breeding for dog health and welfare. And if we understand the spectrum of people's opinions on this, can we achieve a reasonable balance. Well, unfortunately, with the pandemic, we were taught that when people want puppies, they want puppies. And there was massive breeding and buying of dogs. And I'm really not sure uh, how much health testing there was done. And uh, this is a problem with people, not the dogs. So we need some def definitions of health and welfare in dogs. And I know every one of you will say, we want to breed healthy dogs with good welfare. Everyone says that, but specific definitions are challenging and sometimes uh, conflicts can arise. So there's a spectrum of definitions for both dog health and welfare. And these words and specifics matter. So there's a spectrum. At one side of the spectrum, we could say health is the total absence of disease. Well, not many of us live our whole life never experiencing any disease. So maybe we should be thinking about an absence of preventable disease or an acceptable level of disease? And then are we talking a rate of disease or the risk in one breed compared to another breed? And then of course, who makes a definition of what's acceptable? For, for welfare, we could say we're talking about the absence of pain and suffering. But of course, then again, we might more be thinking uh, what's an adequate acceptable level of welfare and how is that defined and we run into additional problems when we try to generalize definitions across cultures countries diseases breeds etc because many places have very different opinions even between europe and the United States. And then things become more complicated when we bring in human-animal bond, human-animal interactions, and how important we think those considerations are uh, when we're looking at breeding healthy dogs with good welfare. So more things for you to think about. This is a statement from the Brachycephalic Working Group in the United Kingdom. Maximizing good health, welfare, and temperament overrides all other considerations for dogs. 
And they are formulating that primarily for their work on brachycephalics or flat-faced dogs, but they want all people interested in dogs and breeding to bring that into their decision-making. But now let's go back to talking about health testing for breeding decisions. Health testing encompasses everything from behavioral assessments and radiographic grading of hips and elbows to clinical exams for heart and eyes, and of course, genetic testing. Many of the most important, common, and severe conditions, however, do not now, and they never will, have a simple, single health test or DNA test often because it's because of complex inheritance and the impact of the environment, but the condition is simply not amenable to a simple, inexpensive health test. So that's where we say the uh, big picture has to come into it, that we have to be able to think about all these conditions when we're choosing dogs for mating. And there's another reference to uh, a blog that I did a while back to help you think about these conditions. So health testing is important, very important to breeding decisions. But in addition to thinking about the big picture, you also have to make sure you act appropriately. So for example, do you do hip x-rays, elbow spines, perhaps? Do you just x-ray them and think about it? Or do you actually follow any rules and recommendations? Do you perhaps cut corners for a specific dog you think it's important to breed? Well, we have seen throughout the world that voluntary programs don't tend to work as well as those where there's some requirement for testing. For example, in Scandinavia, where hip and elbow results are integrated into registration procedures, and they've been able to show definite improvements. But uh, in the United States, for example, it's, these programs are generally voluntary, and then that, first of all, makes it extremely difficult to get data to analyze. And then often the program doesn't come out appearing to work may not be the fault of the pro program, more the fact that the program isn't really being followed. So health testing does not equal healthy, not for the sire and dam and not for the puppies. It's important, but it's not the whole picture. So for genetic testing, the choice of tests to be done within a breed should uh, reflect not only those that are simply available, but they should be ranked relative to other genetic tests and also relative to other conditions in the big picture. And it's important to remember that genetic testing is just one tool in your breeding decisions. And talking about acting appropriately, there's a very simple, straightforward rule that everyone says, all the geneticists and health care providers will tell you, don't eliminate carriers, except for very specific rare genetic conditions. Don't eliminate carriers, just make sure you breed them to clear animals. But is that really being followed? And here's another uh, link you can look in the document and read up some more on that. So this involves a lot of common sense. Not all dam dams and sires with clear test results will be good choices for breeding. And another reference for you there. The big picture approach employs all inputs that define good breeding using common sense, observation, health testing, and a deep knowledge of your dogs and the breed. Good breeders, always difficult to define, but good breeders use appropriate health testing and act appropriately on the results. But health testing alone does not make someone a good breeder. And I have concerns about some of the online sites who would sort of suggest differently. 
But uh, another common sense topic is signs of disease in an individual dog. Bad skin, problems with eyes, breathing difficulties, et cetera, et cetera. In any dog should pre preclude it from breeding at least at that time, perhaps forever. And this actually is law in some countries. Help, well, I'm providing you with lots of information that just probably makes you shake. But there is some help available. Uh, the International Partnership for Dog is focused on tools. We have lots of blogs and articles on many topics, some of which we've covered here, uh, designed to help you in making good breeding decisions. And two developments of great interest are these two. The harmonization of genetic testing for dogs is our database built on available tests and with expert impact, uh, input on health and genetic counseling and the applicability of tests to individual breeds. The Health Strategies Database for Dogs, so the HSDD, lists all the conditions of interest in a breed provided by a health strategy provider, kennel and breed clubs and it's a bit closer to the big picture. But let me present more on these two items uh, and you can see how the information from them can help you make good breeding decisions. Uh, there are more tools available on dogwellnet.com and uh, one is our breeds database and I think we have about 190 breeds right now, it keeps changing. Uh, we list uh, international information on clubs and breed standards, links to health surveys and other work that's going on in the breed. We use uh, Swedish insurance data from Agria uh, to provide breed-specific statistics, and there are statistics available on many breeds that you can look at yourself. And as well, we bring them into breed-specific articles and blogs. For breed-specific breeding strategies, for example, in Sweden, Norway, and Finland, they make sure every breed or almost every breed creates a breed-specific breeding standard. And we have translations for some of those as well as templates. So if you're a breed club uh, wanting to create a breed a specific breeding strategy, this would allow you to see the items that they use. Another important breed specific work that we do is get a grip, get a globally relevant integrated health profile. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but we combine the, this detailed presentation on a specific breed with everything important in the big picture. Uh, we combine that with articles we're doing in the World Small Animal Veterinary Association Bulletin. So also uh, encouraging vets to learn about specific issues they should know about in a breed. So coming back to the harmonization of genetic testing for dogs, the HGTD, uh, you can go to that on Dog Wellnet under genetic testing, or there's a space for it on the home page as well. And you can search by breed or by the test or the condition, or by the genetic test provider or the lab. And uh, this, the HGTD is under the uh, careful um, maintenance by Aimee Llewellyn Zadie, and Aimee also does lots of blogs on HGTD and also on uh, uh, specific genetic counseling and tough issues that people are trying to make sense of. And you can contact her and she might answer your question in an Ask Aimee blog. Also, uh, so getting back to the search by breed, test, 
or a fiend, most people come in and want to search by breed. And another development we have for breeds is the breed relevance ratings. And uh, these evaluate the evidence from research and from experts that a test is appropriate to be used in a given breed. Uh, has it been uh, tested and we're sure it works in that breed because not all genes work the same in all breeds? Does it identify the gene of in, in, interest? And does it uh, identify the condition of interest? And does that condition occur in the breed? The ranking is uh, either a green, yellow, red, or orange paw print. And there's a link here to reading more about the breed relevance ratings. Uh, but it's important to remember that uh, the rating doesn't tell you this is a recommendation or that this is a really important condition in the breed because, of course, many genetic tests are on very rare conditions. You might want to do that test if you have that condition in your line. Uh, you may be concerned about it, but it's not necessarily a magic bullet or a big uh, picture item of interest. And it's always important to remember DNA tests are tools. They're not goals or outcomes. Uh, another really important thing about HGTD is it was created by IPFD and we are most of the information we present on there is independently derived or together with our experts. But uh, it's a collaborative work with sponsors like Embark who provide their data and work to improve uh, breed-specific test results. And uh, we'll, we've had webinars recently on messaging to vet cl uh, to clients, uh, and we're having another webinar with the GTP soon on uh, genetic diversity. So our sponsors are very important. Now, if we searched on Bernie's Mountain Dog in the harmonization development, it would come up with these three tests as being relevant to the breed uh, or of most interest in the breed. Now you say that's not very many and there are many more tests that may be available for all dogs including coat conditions and identification items. But um, these would be the three key tests for Bernie's Mountain Dogs. Here is the list of all the extra tests that you could get or that a GTP would sell you if you sent in a sample to them. And you will see, we won't on this because it's too small, but if you look at it later, there's, or online, there's conditions like the uh, MDR1 and HUU, which are available in all breeds. The MDR1 has a green paw print, and the HUU, the hypercosuria, has a yellow paw print. And yellow paw prints mean they're not, they're kind of equivocal as to whether they apply within that uh, breed. But where it's a green paw print, it means it's a test that either simply applies to all dogs or could be applied to the German Shepherd, or, or sorry, to the Bernese Mountain Dog. Now, if we come back to the Bernese Mountain Dog and these three conditions, degenerative myelopathy, histocytic sarcoma, and von Willebrand's disease, you will see that there's a little key beside degenerative myelopathy, myelopathy and that means there's more information. You'd click on that. It would take you to a description of the condition in the breed and tell you what that is. But in addition to that, we have new information on Dog Wellnet, a blog that I wrote based on Dr. Jerry Bell's article uh, involving correcting the confusion around degenerative myelopathy. 
And this is a test that has been widely promoted in a lot of breeds, but many of those breeds should now reconsider how they're using that test. So we have a blog, Dr. Bell's article, and an infographic to help you work through that information, but unfortunately, not more time to talk about it today. Uh, so coming back to uh, harmonization, you can search by breed, by test, by lab, or go back and forth between them to get the full picture. Now this is from the Health Strategies database, which is not yet online, but will be very soon. And you can see that on the left, we list all the conditions uh, in Bernice Mountain Dogs for which a health strategy provider, uh, either a kennel or breed club, has suggested there should be consideration for breeding. Uh, across the top, there's seven countries from which we have kennel or breed clubs reporting, and they uh, list for any conditions either R1, which says it's a requirement that this be tested for before breeding, R2 is a recommendation, or R3, it just on the radar as a condition that should be uh, considered. And uh, when we have this, this will be closer to the big picture for a breed, but uh, most kennel clubs don't look at basic confirmation or basic temperament, or there may not be health tests for them, but it'll really be a step in the right direction for you to put the genetic tests that are important to do in the context of all these other conditions. Uh, I said I'd speak again briefly on the globally relevant um, health uh, profile uh, or globally relevant integrated health pro profile, get a grip on breed health. These we've done already on quite a number of breeds and the one on English Bulldogs is coming soon. We talk about the breed at a glance, key conditions for health, uh, for caretakers. We talk about uh, health statistics from Sweden, UK, wherever we can get them. We talk about population statistics and breed popularity and um, anything specific on genetic testing and genetic uh, conditions and lots of links to other information. Uh, so where we can, we put in uh, population level disease statistics or death statistics for, the for all breeds. And uh, for example, this is on uh, mortality and cancer. So there's a lot of information. It takes time to go through it, but um, they're really terrific uh, articles. And then they link to the Wasava articles to convince veterinarians what they need to know about breeds. This is a, a chart of all dogs of all nations uh, from 1936. And the key point here is that um, dog breeding is international and has been forever. Uh, the key takeaway is that 160 breeds came to more than 400 breeds in less than 100 years. And this was breeding based on type. And breeding, all breeding from wolves onward uh, happens through selective breeding, and that means line breeding and inbreeding. We can't forget that selective breeding has also produced the wonderful diversity of dogs and many special traits, skills, and abilities. But inbreeding and line breeding are a concern. I recently wrote a blog on uh, this article by C.A. Sharp, who developed the ASHKE, the Australian Shepherd Health and Genetics Institute, and her concerns about the short-term gains of inbreeding outweighed by the long-term costs. And the concern we have about that is that was written in 1990, and uh, the, it's still a concern today. 
So inbreeding, how can it be reduced? Uh, the Nordic Kennel Clubs are careful to keep the inbreeding rate low, and most of them have, for certain breeds at least, a recommended maximum number of offspring per individual dog. Uh, there's an interesting program going on in Great Danes in Germany where they are limiting offspring early in a dog's life and then following them uh, till when they get older and now they know about longevity and they know about the health of their offspring and then they have semen to breed from them then. And uh, average inbreeding coefficients uh, are used in uh, Scandinavia. These are pedigree-based calculations. In Sweden, the inbreeding coefficient of a litter should not exceed the average value for the breed. And they have an online service where you can put in the two dogs uh, registered in Sweden that you intend to use and calculate it. Similarly, in Finland, the inbreeding coefficient is monitored. And for example, for Ridgebacks, there is a breed club recommendation to keep the maximum five generation inbreeding coefficient of litters at 6.25%. Now, Embark is doing a great project on genomic based uh, inbreeding coefficients, and uh, they are coming out breed by breed. These are two breeds the German Shepherd and the Bulldog, both of which have average inbreeding coefficients of almost 30%, which means many dogs have higher values still. And if we remember that 25% is the level of inbreeding we would expect from a brother-sister mating, that means dogs of these breeds with an average uh, COI uh, share more genetic material from common ancestors sisters than would arise from a brother-sister mating. And there's a reference there for you to uh, learn more about the difference between pedigree and genomic uh, COIs. So this work on genetic diversity is going to be ongoing and it's very important in the preserve and improve your breed approach. And something to think about for your breed when you see the statistics. One thing to think about is the source of pedigree dogs for breeding. AKC numbers indicate, indicate that a, less than a third of the litter complement that they hear about ends up being individually registered. So that's less than one third of puppies born end up being registered. And that represents the potential breeding stock. That means two thirds theoretically of the genetic diversity is lost on a yearly registration basis. If selection of breeding stock is further narrowed by showing very specific types, only using show winning males, having too many litters, this decreases further. There is a range across breeds. And for example, the Bernese Mountain Dog estimate is that 43% of pups born are registered. But other data uh, from a while ago estimated that 9 to 12 percent of eligible dogs are bred. Now, in the Bernese Mountain Dog, we know that they're showing signs of low lifespan, cancer, reproductive problems, which have all been uh, associated with a lack of genetic diversity. So something to think about for sure. So where are you at now? Well, what you see in your breed is what you got from what you did, all of you. Uh, what is the evidence, think about it, what is the evidence that people in your breed have been selecting for health, longevity, and good temperament? Is that what you're seeing in your breed? What is the evidence that people are selecting for the benefit of the breed versus their personal achievement? Are dog exhibitions and dog shows embracing the diversity within the breed or are they narrow by type? I've talked to judges and they always say, we only judge for soundness, but then I see a lot of unsound dogs. If you want long-lived dogs, you should bring longevity into your breeding decisions. 
So what criteria have been used in selection? Is there evidence of overuse of popular show winning sires? Is there a narrow view of type and desirable appearance versus uh, engaging the diversity of the breed and using a broad informed view of overall health, longevity, and performance. If you say we want healthy, long-lived dogs with good temperaments, but then choose simply on the basis of getting a popular, designed, best-in-show puppy, you're unlikely to ch achieve the former. And data on uh, genetic studies of hunting dogs have shown them to have a higher frequency of genes for improved physiology, intelligence, and endur endurance compared to companion dogs because probably they were selected on those attributes. Again, think about it. So what are the solutions? Review the criteria used for selection and use the big picture approach. Reduce the relatedness of sire to dam, and there's good tools for coefficients of inbreeding that are coming available. Limit numbers of offspring by individual dogs, and that includes the popular sire and his brothers and sons. Use a higher proportion of available healthy in the broadest sense stock. <clears throat> Within breed crossing can be considered between working and showing lines, make use of overseas bloodlines, but very carefully, they might be not that genetically distinct. And for some of the most challenged breeds, we have to think about out outcrossing, carefully planned and monitored. And the Finnish Kennel Club is moving ahead on this. And here you have a reference for a lot of information on good crossbreeding programs. So one other point, do dog shows need to change? Could we have health tests done before dogs enter the ring and they come in with points for good health? I'll just throw that out for you to think about. And then in the end, keep looking. All the information you need to make breeding decisions to support and, prove and preserve the health of your dogs and sustain your breed is available. You just have to use it. Thank you very much, and I think we'll have time for some questions. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Bonnet, for your fascinating talk. Um, we actually have not a ton of time, but some great questions from our live audience. So uh, audience, please feel free. To, you can submit them through the chat. Uh, but I think also we're going to give you some options for asking your questions of Dr. Bonnet outside of the session because we are pressed for time. Um, the first question is really talking about COI, and it's really around the difference between uh, this is an example where an eight gen aeration um, pedigree COI was around 2%, but the DNA COI was 12.5%. So can you talk about genetic versus pedigree COI and, and maybe some of the genetic, the options to get genetic COI? Sure. The nutshell version is that the genomic COI is a much more accurate representation of the degree of material that the dog has inherited. Uh, Pedigree-based COIs give all the puppies 50% from the mother and 50% from the father, and that's not the way it works. The only thing, it's, it's not appropriate to say that the COIs, the genomic COIs are meaningless. They're probably very meaningful, depending on how many dogs are used in the calculation. But we know that eight generation and five generation pedigrees always underestimate the true uh, inbreeding based on the genetic analysis. So that's the short um, answer. Uh, and you may need more information to follow it. If you do pedigree based ones and follow them over time, that can be useful, but it may be probable that you have an underestimation of the degree of inbreeding if it's based purely on pedigree values. Oh, I'm not hearing you. Um, 
Kathy? Technology is great, except when it doesn't work. Um, I'm just going to try and sneak one more yep, question in, uh, and then we'll call it for time. Uh, this is a question about a breed that didn't have, uh, this is specifically about elbow dysplasia, but say a breed doesn't have experience with a certain condition and it comes up out of nowhere. Could you kind of talk them through how they could use some of the information on um, dog wellnet maybe to, to help them learn about strategies to deal with that health condition? Right, so uh, once the health strategies database is up, you can compare whether any breeds anywhere else have experienced a problem with it, but you can probably find that out now. With a multifactorial type of condition like elbow dysplasia, it's not a simple yes, no inheritance of a single gene. So it's quite possible to get one dog with bad elbow conformation or some problem that leads it to have the condition without it being a genetic problem throughout the whole breed. So you've got to balance that also with other conditions in the breed that might be much more um, important to the breed. So keep an eye on it, but don't panic when it's one case is what I would say. And if we're not able to take any more of these um, talks. Can you put in that link I sent you? I've put a blog in my blogs on dogwellnet.com under Brenda's blogs and people are free to make comments and ask questions there and I'll do my best to answer them. Yes, so we we definitely do have to wrap up. My apologies. Um, once again, this has been great. We will email over the questions that have already been asked so that you have those, Dr. Bonnet. And then everyone else, uh, you can go okay. to dogwellnet.com and there's a Q&A from Embark Summit uh, in the blog sections that, that you can go interact with. So once again, thanks so much for your time. We have coming up right now uh, a presentation by Embark's own co-founder and chief science officer, Adam Boyko, speaking on genetic testing, driving scientific discovery and opportunities for building a future of healthier, longer lived dogs. So uh, please feel free to head over to that. And um, once again, thank you so much, Dr. Barnett. Have a great rest of the summit. Thank you. Thanks everyone.